This week on the CNET Tech Review, our tour from the show floor at E3, the Nintendo DS goes 3D, how to use eBay like a pro, and SoundHound sniffs out the name of that song that's stuck in your head. It's all coming up right now. Hey everyone, I'm Molly Wood and welcome to the CNET Tech Review, the show where we run down the hottest videos of the week and tell you which are good, which are bad, and offer some tech wisdom in the form of the bottom line. Let's start with the good. Another electronic entertainment expo has come and gone. At this year's E3 show, Microsoft tried to connect with Xbox fans, Nintendo put 3D gaming in players' hands, and Sony PS3 gamers were on the move. Of course, CNET was there to cover it all. Here's Brian Tong with his report from the show floor. From way downtown Los Angeles for CNET TV, I'm Tim Kittrow saying NBA Jam is back. Boom shakalaka. Brian Tong here with CNET.com on the show floor at E3 2010. And we saw a lot of themes here this year. We saw 3D gaming, motion controlling is here and here to stay, and retro gaming is making a comeback. We're here inside Nintendo's booth, and you can see behind me, everyone is getting their hands on the Nintendo 3DS. Now, we really can't show you the screen because it doesn't do justice, and you won't be able to see how good it looks, but there's a reason there are huge lines here to get their hands on this little new toy. Now, I know you guys can't see what I'm playing, but I'm playing with the 3D version of Nintendogs, and this dog is very cute. Now 3D is not only going to be on a little handheld, the Sony PS3 is pushing it hard with Killzone 3. We're here inside of Sony's PlayStation booth and another theme that we've seen here that is huge is motion based gaming. So here in my hand, I got the PlayStation Move. If you guys want your ultimate fix of 3D gaming and motion gaming, well this is the place to be. Put on my shades because it's game time. Ooh. If you like motion control gaming but you don't want a controller, check out Microsoft's Kinect where your body is the controller. Now we've all heard the saying, what's old is now new, and that same thing holds true with gaming with classics coming back like Mortal Kombat and NBA Jam. We had a game so many years ago in NBA Jam that was truly like the most raucous, horsepower, high energy octane game ever uh, made. And if you look back at it, you know, it's one step removed really from the early Pong and Atari kind of things. I think there was something magic about the 90s and people playing video games. You know, a lot of people were probably in, you know, high school, grade school or something like that. And so seeing old games with the new presentation, with the hard hardware and the technology that we have today, there's something nostalgic about that. So it's a combination of nostalgia and, you know, the new. So I think it's a great combination. So at E3 2010, we saw a lot of great new announcements for hardware. We saw a lot of great games. I'm just going to enjoy the show floor and let's hope I can make it out of here alive. Don't worry. I'm told BT made it out just fine. Of course, I haven't seen him in a couple of days, but mm -hmm. Anyway, for even more of our extensive E3 coverage, including more highlights from the big three game makers press conferences, head over to CNETV.com or just stick around until a little later in the show. Of course, with all those new games coming out, you might want to consider getting rid of some of your old ones. Want to sell them on eBay? Tell them how, Josh. Hey, I'm Josh Lowenson for CNET, and today I'm going to show you how to sell things on eBay. eBay is a great place to pawn off potentially high-value items like cell phones or game consoles, especially if you don't feel like doing the whole face-to-face -face thing on Craigslist. As an example, I'm going to use a mobile phone. To get started, you need an account on eBay, which is free. After signing up, click on the Sell link at the top of the screen, then the big blue Start Selling button. eBay will then ask you some keywords about your phone or device. All you have to do here is type in phone or whatever you're selling, then hit the big search button. On this next screen, I'm going to pick cell phones and smartphones and hit the big blue continue button again. Then I'm going to type in the brand or model of my phone to see if it's in eBay's database. 
Once you've found the model of your phone or gadget, just select it and you'll be taken to the most important page of all, the one where you tell buyers about your item and how much you're selling it for. To get a good idea of what kind of price is set, do a search to see what other similar items have sold for. It's also worth setting a reserve price at or a little bit below the number so you can make sure it won't sell for less than you're willing to part with. Choosing this option will cost you anywhere from $2 to 1% of your reserve price if it's over $200. A few things that help in the way of attracting prospective buyers is to take some photos of your item. In all likelihood, eBay already has a stock photo from the manufacturer, but a picture of your device or whatever accessories you're selling with can go a long way towards making your buyers more confident. Just keep in mind eBay charges 15 cents for each additional photo beyond the first one, so use them sparingly. You'll also want to be dead honest about your item's description if there are any problems with the device. Things like scratches, cracks, water damage, or a dying battery should be stated up front. Otherwise, you could end up with negative feedback and an angry buyer. Another thing to keep in mind is that you'll need a PayPal account if you intend to do an electronic payment. This is the best route if you want to get paid immediately. Signing up for PayPal is free, but they do take a cut of a payment if you're on a Premier or Business account, which is required to take credit card transactions. Though if your buyer is also a PayPal user, it will be free on both ends. As for when to set your auction end time, the longer you have it on the site, the better the chances are someone will see it and add it to their watch list. You'd also be wise to time it to end in the late afternoon or early evening on a weekday, since that's when the most bidding activity happens. Once it's up, you just have to sit there and wait it out. Don't be scared if nobody bids on it in the first few days, as most of the action happens in the last few hours. And when it's all said and done, be sure to ship it out in a timely manner. You can use these instructions to sell just about anything on the site, though the one downside is that eBay can charge some pretty steep fees on top of what you paid to list your item. If your item doesn't sell in an auction, you don't pay a thing, but if it does, eBay takes 9% of the final value, up to $50. I'm Josh Lowenson, and this has been a how-to on how to sell your stuff on eBay. Good luck selling those old gadgets. And now that you know some of the tricks the power sellers use, I bet you can figure out how to use them to be a better buyer, too. Moving on in the good, one of my first favorite iPhone apps was Shazam. You just hold your phone up, hit tag now, and boom, you've got the name of the song and the artist who sings it. Most of the time, anyway. Well, with this new app called Soundhound, you don't even need to be listening to a song to ID it. Seriously, take a look. Ever hear a song playing that you've just got to have, or got a tune stuck in your head that you can't place? Soundhound is an app for iPhone and Android that can ID those songs. I'm Jessica Dahlquart from CNETdownload.com taking a look at Soundhound. Like other apps, Soundhound can identify a recorded song as it plays after just a few seconds. But unlike its biggest rival, Soundhound can also tag music that you sing, hum, type, or speak into the phone. After searching, you'll see a plethora of information about the artist or song, including the artist's bio, related songs and videos, and an opportunity to buy the song or share a link to the song via email or Twitter. One of the app's best features is providing a list of lyrics if they're available. If they're not, Soundhound will link you to a Google search for the song's lyrics. The iPhone version of Soundhound is much more advanced than the Android version. When you buy a song, it'll plop you right into the iTunes library for easy ordering. Soundhound on Android whisks you to the Amazon.com music store online, though that could change when Google releases its own music store as early as this fall. Soundhound on iPhone also has the added bonus of hooking into your running iPod and providing an artist bio, song information, and all the other goodies, including song lyrics, for songs that you already own. We hope that Soundhound will soon add the Android Media Player into its Android app. There are two versions of Soundhound for both Android and iPhone. The free version cuts off tagging after five songs per month when you record, sing, or hum into the app, but there's no cap to searching with your voice or by text. These apps are also ad-supported. The premium versions, called Soundhound Infinity, cost a one-time fee of $4.99 and give you unlimited song IDs and no ads. I'm Jessica Dalcourt, and you've been looking at Soundhound for Android and iPhone. Yeah, I'm going to have to bribe our producer Jamie to get a clip of Jessica singing that video. See you on YouTube, Jessica. All right, we have one more good thing for you today, a desktop computer. Awesome, right? Actually, this little Dell is a pretty good bargain, but you better act fast. Hi, I'm Rich Brown, senior editor for CNET.com. 
Today we're going to take a look at the Dell Studio XPS 7100. So this is a mid-range performance PC and this particular config has a fixed price. It's $1149, uh, at least until the end of July. And for that price you get an excellent deal in a mid-tower gaming system. Uh, it comes with a Blu-ray drive, wireless networking, a 6-core AMD chip, as well as a very fast Radeon HD 5870 graphics card. It's not quite as fast as some other PCs in its price range in terms of uh, application performance, but for gaming, it's one of the best deals we've seen all year. And Dell makes a distinction with this system from its other uh, Intel-based Studio XPS models with the dark gray front panel. Now in the front, you get a media card reader up top. There's a Blu-ray drive here. This door slides down and you get a couple of USB jacks. And up top here, you get a little device tray uh, with a couple of USB ports and analog audio inputs as well. You can see the graphics card has got two DVI video outputs as well as HDMI and DisplayPort. Uh, because it's a Radeon card, you can do up to three displays at one time off of this single card. Uh, there's also a couple wireless uh, antenna jacks here for uh, wireless networking. And on the motherboard, you've got uh, digital audio output, uh, eSATA port, a couple of USBs, Ethernet, as well as uh, 7.1 analog audio jacks. Uh, now missing are FireWire as well as USB 3.0. Uh, which is sort of a newer, faster uh, data input that we expect will become common probably by the end of the year, maybe into next year. Uh, so it's not crucial that it's on this system. There aren't that many devices out there that support USB 3. Uh, and FireWire is actually getting a little bit long in the tooth. Still, we've seen other uh, desktops that offer the whole gamut of inputs. So while there might be a few other inputs you could add, for the most part, Dell has covered its bases. So it's a little crowded inside the XPS 7100. Uh, there's a dual slot graphics card right here, that's the Radeon 5870. And you can see Dell has a nice thick bracket to uh, keep the card in place in shipping. That's a nice touch, but it also sort of blocks this extra hard drive bay. So Dell has expanded its typical design and added a second drive slot here behind the, drive, the hard drive you see right here. Uh, that's great, we're glad that you can add a second drive. Uh, we would still probably prefer it if Dell had faced the drives outwards, or like we've seen on some newer PCs, through the front. Sliding drives in through the front of the case makes hot swapping, upgrading, changing drives really simple. Uh, and we're hoping that becomes a standard as well. Now there's a six core CPU here from AMD. Uh, and for expansion slots, there's the graphics card, wireless card, and then there's one standard PCI slot down here in the bottom. That's it. There's no second graphics card slot. Uh, really, room for upgrading is pretty limited. You can see the memory slots are all taken as well. So if you want an upgrade foundation, this might not be the config for you. That said, it's still a pretty great deal considering you get Blu-ray, wireless, as well as a super fast 3D card uh, for under $1,200. So Dell says the price for this configuration will stay until the end of July. At that price, and with this specific feature set, this is an outstanding system. If the price changes, you might want to do some more comparison to see how it stacks up uh, to other PCs in the market. But for now, for any gamer looking for a mid-range performance PC, we absolutely recommend this system. So I'm Rich Brown, this is the Dell Studio XPS 7100. That's so nice of Tracy's dad from Flash Forward to stop by and review that for us, right? They look so much alike. Oh, fine, I know. Nobody watched that show. Now it's canceled. But I liked it, and they do look alike. All right, let's take a break while I try to find a new favorite TV show. But don't go anywhere. The bad stuff is just around the corner when we come back. Welcome back to the CNET Tech Review, your weekly digest of all things good and bad from CNET TV. Now let's go back to E3 for some of the bad. During Microsoft's Xbox 360 press conference on Monday, they spent a lot of time showing off all the cool things that you can do with Kinect. Unfortunately, they were using Microsoft engineers for many of the demos. Let's take a look as Laura runs us through something called Video Kinect. Now, with Kinect, the same magic that allows you to control your Xbox 360 with your voice also allows you to communicate with the people you care about. This is Video Connect, and here to help me show it to you is Laura, one of the engineers building social experiences on Xbox Live. Hey, Laura. Hey, Mark. What I love about Connect is that it's not just about video games. The sensor also lets me video chat with my friends and family, and the microphone lets me do that without a headset. So let me show you an example of what Video Connect will look like. Here are my friends. Some of them are on Xbox Live, and some are on Windows Live Messenger.
And here on this page are a bunch of my relatives, my parents, my brother and his wife, and my twin sister, Kristen. Kristen lives in Texas, and I live in Seattle, so video chat is a great way to keep in touch. We sent Kristen a sensor so that she could help me demo this today. So let's call her up. Hey, Kristen, how's it going? Hey, pretty good. Been busy with work. I can see you're busy too. Yeah, I'm here at E3. Everyone, say hi to Kristen. Hey, everybody. So we finally get to show everyone what you've been working on. Yeah, I'm pretty excited about that. So here's a few things that you haven't seen yet. One thing we can do is watch stuff together. You see those topics at the bottom of your screen? Yeah. I can select one of them. And we can watch a video together. The power to control the elements is bestowed upon a chosen few. Hey, that's the last airbender. Wasn't there a video game about that? Yeah, there was. My coworkers played it just to boost their gamer score. Maybe you should do the same thing. What? My gamer score is 100% legit. Yeah, right. <laughs> okay. Well, this video is great, but we're going to move on now. Another cool thing that Kinect can do is track you as you move around. You should give that a try. Okay. Wow, hey, that's pretty cool. It's, it's following me. Mm -hmm. So how does that work? So here's a slightly geeky answer. Connect tracks your skeleton as you move, so it can follow you and keep you in the shot. It happens automatically. So I don't have to adjust the camera myself? Nope, we're trying to keep it simple. So there's one more thing I want to show. You ready? Yeah. Now to do that, I got to end the video chat, so you should say goodbye to everyone. All right, bye everybody. <laughs> Thanks for helping us out today. Y'all ready? Xbox, in chat. Thanks, Laura. Oh my goodness, that was so painful. And also, how do we know that that's her twin sister and not just the same girl in a wig? Although, I do have to give the folks playing Connect Sports a few extra points for enthusiasm. How's my butt look? <laughs> oh no! Oh, got it! Oh. Close one, that was close so one. Close. <laughs> Oh, those crazy kids. Those crazy, awkward kids. All right, next up is a brand new 3D TV from Panasonic. Wait, now, wasn't this actually our Best of CES award winner from this year? Hmm. Well, let's watch. There must be a reason it's in the bad this week. Hi, I'm David Katzmeyer from CNET, and I'm sitting next to the Panasonic TCP50VT25. This is a 50-inch flat panel plasma TV, the smallest in Panasonic's flagship VT25 series. There's also a 54, 58, and 65 inch member of the series, as well as a 50 inch model to Best Buy exclusive that has a silver bezel called the VT20. Otherwise, it's basically identical. In fact, all these are basically identical, which is why this review will apply to all sizes. This is uh, Panasonic's 3D TV for 2010. It's a plasma model and has some advantages over some LCD-based 3D TVs we've tested. We'll get to that in a little bit. Um, but first, 3D TV in general, you do require specialized 3D content, uh, Blu-ray discs for the highest quality. There's also some channels on Direct TV and a lot more uh, coming soon, but for now, content is pretty limited. You also need to use 3D glasses uh, to view the 3D content on this TV. The Panasonic comes with one pair of those glasses. The additional pairs cost $150 right now, although we do expect them to drop in price, but of course it does cost a lot of money to outfit your entire family for 3D viewing. Uh, again, we'll talk about a little bit about the 3D performance in a bit, but first this is a fully functional 2D TV, and uh, the styling on it is uh, pretty slick. Uh, this VT25 series has the bronze bezel. It's slightly different from the standard glossy black you'll find. It's also got a little bit of silver above and below, and of course some silver accents on the swivel stand here, and all in all we really like the appearance of this TV. Aside from 3D, the uh, main features on this flagship TV include 
Panasonic's Viera Cast, which is a IPTV solution that includes uh, Netflix, Amazon Video On Demand, uh, Twitter, Fox Sports are coming soon. Netflix won't be available until July of this year, and a lot of the other content is sparser than some of the other uh, internet-connected TVs uh, around. We do like the fact that you can adjust some of the arrangements within the Viera Cast menu, which is a new feature for 2010. There's also the ability to hook up a keyboard, so if you'd like to Twitter from your TV, you'll like that feature. The flagship model, Panasonic did equip the VT2025 with a good selection of picture adjustments in the custom setting. When you go into custom, you can play with the pro settings, which involves uh, a lot of color temperature adjustments, a full color management system, gamma, and a few others. The THX mode on this TV, which we did find was the best overall, isn't all that adjustable, however. Uh, of course, it does start out pretty good, so it's not really a big issue. There's also a few 3D settings on this TV, but it's not as extensive an adjustment selection as you can find on Samsung's 3D TVs, which also include an uh, upconversion system to convert 2D to 3D. Again, Panasonic doesn't include that system in this model. Connectivity on the VT25 is fairly extensive. Around back you'll find three HDMI inputs, two component video inputs, a PC input. There's also this RS-232 port here only on the VT25, not on the VT20 series, that's used for connection to uh, custom installation systems. Side panel has a fourth HDMI input and issue an SD card slot and a couple of USB jacks. One of those is nice if you buy the optional Wi-Fi dongle, which is uh, useful for if you don't want to connect an Ethernet cable to the back of the TV. The Wi-Fi dongle does cost 100 bucks, though. When we took the Panasonic into the lab, we were very impressed by its 3D and its 2D picture quality. We'll start with 3D, though. Compared to the Samsung, which is the only other one we've tested, the uh, Panasonic was superior in terms of reducing crosstalk, which are these sort of ghostly doubled images that you can see sometimes uh, in certain material. A lot more crosstalk on the Samsung than we saw on the Panasonic. Both exhibited excellent detail and gave you a, a really good stereoscopic 3D effect. Of course, smaller screen size and a couple of other issues are different from the theater, but in general, it's a very satisfying illusion. But the real story here is the 2D picture quality, at least until 3D becomes a lot more common. 2D on this TV is among the best we've ever tested. It starts with the excellent black level performance. When you turn down the lights and watch a relatively dark scene, those blacks are really inky and uh, really help improve the pop and overall saturation of the entire picture. Speaking of saturation, the color on this TV is very good, not quite as good as some of the very best models we've tested, but in THX mode, color accuracy gets really good skin tones and, again, plenty of saturation and pop. We did find some issues with the 1080p24. It does have excellent cadence, which does take advantage of the film-based Blu-rays and DVDs. But on the other hand, we did see some slight false contouring artifacts. But again, we did prefer to use the 1080p24 mode on this TV, which is labeled 96 hertz. We also appreciated the standard picture quality advantages of plasma, which include very good off-angle and picture uniformity. Panasonic also improved the anti-glare screen on this model, so it does preserve black levels as well as reduce reflections better than previous Panasonic plasmas. That's a quick look at the Panasonic TCP VT20-25 series, and I'm David Katzmeyer. Oh yeah, now I remember one pair of 3D glasses. Am I really going to spend three grand on a TV so I can sit and watch it all by myself? I don't think so. Which brings us to this week's bottom line. As we saw in Brian's video earlier, 3D gaming is coming, whether you like it or not. Now, Nintendo skipped adding 3D to the Wii this year, instead giving us the new 3DS. Brian got his hands on one long enough to give us this first look. This is Nintendo 3DS. Brian Tong here with CNET.com, and this in my hand is our first look at the Nintendo 3DS. Now, you guys can't really see this, but this... <laughs> It's awesome to look at. This doesn't require any 3D glasses whatsoever. You're looking at a 3.5 inch widescreen 3D panel on the top. Again, no glasses required. You also get a few different controls. You have this analog stick over here on the left side. You'll get the standard D-pad and the controls. You see the standard camera here at the top on top of the screen. But if we flip it around to the back, you'll actually notice two additional cameras that will allow you to take 3D pictures of yourself and then watch them here on the 3DS. Also, you have here on this uh, far left-hand side, you have a slider that actually lets you turn either the 3D function on or off and even change the depth of the 3D. Now, this is just a little gameplay sample. We can't actually play any games on this unit. They're just showing a video sample. But uh, head on, this looks pretty amazing and something that we just haven't seen before. Now, there's no pricing on the 3DS. We don't know when it'll be released yet, but there you have it. This, this is awesome stuff. This is going to change things a little bit. I'm Brian Tom CNET.com with your first look at the Nintendo 3DS.
The bottom line this week, that's how you do 3D. No glasses. You hear me, Panasonic? And that is our show for this week, everyone. Tune in next week when we will continue iPhone 4 Madness as the new phone goes on sale. I hope our pre-order went through. Until then, don't be afraid to check out more great CNET video at CNETTV.com. See you next time, and thank you for watching. Thank you.